Okay, I'm alive. This is the first time I've done this. Uh, a new thing, so hopefully a few of you will join in and watch. What I'm going to do this afternoon, it's Sunday afternoon in England, um, and what, I'm, what I think I'd like to do is have a detailed look at what's going on with Bishop Strickland, because I think there's loads to it. Um, so we're going to start off by, and I, I would say I've done a, a, like I've written quite a lot about this is in the Catholic Herald. Um, and I've got an, a good connection with America. So um, with Catholic Unscripted, we went over in April. Uh, we had a great trip and um, made lots of friends then. But I've actually been traveling to America regularly for a number of years uh, in contact with fellow Catholics. And we're talking about um, evangelization, what's going on in the church, sharing information, stuff like that. So um, I've got a fairly good understanding, I'd say, of what's going on. Uh, okay, so I've got a number of... things to show you from my screen and the first one is this new story which is obviously um, the story in Vatican News of Bishop Strickland being removed so if you haven't heard Bishop, Bishop Joseph Strickland is the uh, Bishop of Tyler Texas um, and yesterday morning while I think um, Bishop Tyler was Bishop Strickland was still asleep, <laughs> the Vatican issued um, the no a notice in its bulletino that the Holy Father himself had removed Bishop Joseph Strickland from the pastoral governance of the, of the Diocese of Tyler, and appointed Bishop Joe Vasquez of Austin as the Apostolic Administrator of the same diocese. And that means that it's sede vacante, that the uh, Episcopal seat is empty. Now, this this follows on from, if you've been following the story, there was a, an apostolic visitation ordered by the Pope last June in Tyler, which was entrusted to two US bishops, B Bishop Dennis Sullivan of Camden and Bishop Emeritus Gerald Kikanas of Tucson. Um, as a result of that, I mean, it's set like it says, and I think it's important to say that it says in here, a conducted that they conducted an exhaustive inquiry into all aspects of governance and leadership of Tyler by its ordinary Bishop Joseph Strickland. And as a result of that visitation, the statement concludes the recommendation was made to the Holy Father that the continuation of office of Joseph Strickland was not feasible. After months of careful consideration by the Dicastery for Bishops and the Holy Father, the decision was reached that the resignation should be requested. So they presented that request for resignation in 2023. And Bishop Strickland had already said that he would decline to resign if he was asked because he'd been given the mandate from Pope Benedict XVI. And so he declined to resign from office. And this, uh, as a result of that, Pope Francis decided to remove him, which, to be honest, there's not really a mechanism um, for doing that, if the if the bishop, in terms of canon law, unless the bishop is guilty of some delict, and that there, there should be a process, a due process, because as Catholics we believe in justice, don't we? So you'd have thought that that would be essential in in any process like that, but that's not what's happened here. Um, he's just been removed from office. He's not been given a, a specific reason for it. Um, looking at the what's been said in the Vatican Bulletino, one could speculate that um, they're going to say that there's some sort of financial malfeasance or something like that. Um, I think it's very unwise of the Pope to do it in this manner in terms of the fact that he hasn't give a, given a good reason why he's removing Bishop Strickland. He's just, it's just like, um, you know, sort of like a dictator. 
you know, he's just gone. It's interesting that that book was written by him, <laughs> by Henry Sire, the dictator pope, because, you know, you do sort of wonder, he does seem to act in a very in dictatorial sort of way. And this is a really good example of it. So what's all this about then? And it, I think the first thing to say is that it's a really, really unusual thing to do. Um, to remove a bishop from a um, like act from acting um, as a diocesan bishop, it very very rarely happens. Uh, what I wanted to do was show you some other bits and pieces. Uh, Let me see if I sorry, obviously I've uh, I'm new to this. I'm not sure that I can do that. Can I? So if I change to that one, let's show you that. No, it won't. Okay. I stopped it. Now I have to do it again by the screen. Yeah, I do. Okay. So the next one that I wanted to show you was this one so I'll, I'll try and put all these links in the bottom in the show notes but so this is a podcast that I did um, on the Catholic Herald podcast with Dr Gavin Ashton um, when we talk about what was going on with Strickland um, and basically a lot of the information I'm going to put in this video is in that podcast so you can go over to the Catholic Herald and have a read of that if you want to uh, have a listen to it, sorry. <laughs> um, okay, so the next thing then is to show you some bits from my blog. Again, you can uh, you can check those out. I'll put the links at the bottom. So the first one is this, which is why has Bishop Strickland been removed? Now, I think it's probably... Um, because of this. <laughs> so this is a tweet that Bishop Strickland made. This was the big thing, I think, that um, pe people started talking about. Um, it was on May the 13th this year. <clears throat> and he'd got into kind of a debate. He'd been asked to be part of a, a an online thing with Patrick Coffey in a conference, and there was a guy on there who was a Sedeve Cantist. And uh, basically, he, like loads of people, withdrew and... Some friends of mine withdrew and Bishop Strickland withdrew as well. And then it, out by way of clarifying that, he issued this tweet, which was, please allow me to clarify regarding Patrick Coffin, um, about uh, challenging the authenticity of Pope Francis. Um, and he says, quite wisely, I disagree. I believe Pope Francis is the real Pope. But then he adds on to the end of it that he rejects his program of undermining the deposit of faith. Now, I think when that tweet was posted, lots of people were like, you know, that was a bit um, close to the mark, a bit near the knuckle sort of thing uh, for the bishop to say. Um, and I think it probably created quite a lot of heat. Uh, so... It all goes back to really, and I'll say this in the in the Catholic Herald podcast. It all goes back to um, a USSB meeting where. Um, sorry, I'm a bit distracted. So I'm, I'm just figuring out how to click through the screens as I go. That's it. Right, let's get that one up. Right, so. And so at the at the USSB meeting, and this is when I first recognised what was going on. Um, it was a case where we had McElroy and Supich stood up, and they were arguing against the preeminence of abortion. Um, and the guys who stood up against them were Shapu and Strickland, and they stood up and gave really really good interventions. So and. It seemed very much at that point, so this was before McElroy was made cardinal, which obviously was a very controversial move um, because he was promoted over Gomez. 
who was his metropolitan. So um, it looked like a real snub to Gomez. And Gomez is, is you know, seen as more orthodox bishop. And McElroy has been really well known for being right out there supporting women deacons and, you know, on alphabet people issues and all kinds of stuff like that. So um, it was... You you kind of get the idea that these are the people that Pope Francis wants to put into certain positions. So you can see um, that, that from that early point, Strickland was putting himself, I think it was 2019, he was putting himself up as a counter voice to this these voices of orthodoxy. Uh, to these, He was putting himself up as a voice of orthodoxy. And, it, you know, he was... Um, going to be in conflict with those guys. So whatever Sue Pitch and people like that are feeding back to the Vatican, then it's going to be not good. It's not going to be a good report about Strickland. So then I wanted to come to this pillar report. This is from March 2022, because Pope Francis has got form. He removed this bishop, uh, Bishop Daniel, Daniel Fernando Torres, um, from Puerto Rico. And he, he removed him. And the reason, so, you know, this was like really interesting. This is an excellent article in The Pillar. Um, and if you don't know, The Pillar is a, a Catholic publication. It's really a good publication. It's run by two canon lawyers. So, that you know, that it tends to be thorough and they know their stuff. So um, this is an analysis of what happened to this Bishop Torres. And basically, so the first bit is that it says what happened, um, that he'd been relieved of his leadership on March the 9th. The announcement didn't give any reasons, just like Bishop Strickland. And the bishop is 57 years old and in good health. So there's not, it doesn't say, so it basically, if he had meant, if he had a problem with his health and he couldn't, could no longer continue, then that would be a valid reason. Um, the bishop gave his versions of events and branded, branded the Pope's action totally unjust. A successor of the apostles is now being replaced without even undertaking what would be due can canonical process to remove a parish priest. So you can see the Pope can do this he, because he's the supreme legislator, but it is you know, a deficit of justice for him to do so. So we've got this. This is the dictator Pope, isn't it? This is where he just throws his way around and what he says goes is not interested in justice um father alexander lucy smith uh, you know has posted this brilliant quote i think it's from cicero that says for my friends everything for my enemies not even justice and that's really you know what we see being enacted here i think that was a brilliant way of putting it um i want you to know that it's not for me to explain the decision that i can't explain myself so he's basically saying you know, why should I have to explain it? Because this doesn't make any sense to anyone. Um, so it goes through basically what he said. Again, I'll post the link there. Um, he, so one of the things that he did, and Strickland did this as well, was to speak out about vaccination. Um, Torres refused to sign a joint statement issued by the, the Puerto Rican bishops, which said Catholics have a duty to be vaccinated against coronavirus virus and didn't see how a conscientious objection can be invoked from Catholic morality. Um, so that was one of the things that he, he, he went against. And Strickland actually was, you know, has said some things about the, about the vaccine as well. So we've got a bit of uh, canonical detail here, which is really, really useful. The Code of Canon Law identifies four ways diocesan and bishops can lose their, their office. Death transfer, resignation, or criminal penalty, right? Now, you know, none of those are <laughs> relevant, it seems to me, for either of these two cases. Um, there are two reasons for a bishop to resign in Canon 401. Paragraph 1 states that bishops are requested to present their resignations when they reach the age of 75 and the ordinary retirement age, but the, the Canon specifically says it's a request, not a requirement, and the deference to the long established right of the bishop to see to his see as a successor of the apostles unless he has committed some canonical crime so this is important because the like the pope isn't the boss of the bishops it's a, for like it's a fraternity 
and they are supposed to be co what's interesting is that Pope Francis has really accentuated this hasn't he he said that he sort of rejected the the um you know the 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 title of Pope and he wanted to be called the Bishop of Rome um and he kept going on about uh, more accountability for the, earlier on in this papacy you know for the bishops of that they should work in a in a collegial way um which so, you know it, like again we've got this same thing it, it, we encounter time and time again where the his words and his actions don't marry up with each other um i remember you know reading laudato c and it, it basically it, it cites two sources for its authority one is pope francis's previous writings and the other is various bishop conferences around the world so um he has sort of been reaching out to this kind of episcopal collegiality thing um when it suits him but then he just seems to ignore it and um it enacts his supreme legislator position when when it suits him uh, paragraph two of the canon says that bishops are earnestly requested to resign if they become unable to fill their office for reasons of health or some other grave cause but again the law frames are a matter of request resignations cannot be compelled if they are to be valid um so privation there's is another reason for removal of the office some canonical crimes would be abuse of office which can be punished by a privation of ecclesial office including that of a diocesan bishop but canonical penalties have to be imposed as a result of a legal process either a formal trial or a canonical extrajudicial process Pope Francis has broadened the list of crimes for bishops specifically can be deprived of their offices through two pieces of canonical legislation. Um, but in all those cases, loss of office is expected by canon law to follow a clearly delineated canonical process and a guilty verdict. So what's going on here? Again, we've got Pope Francis not playing by his own rules, haven't we? The most grave crimes in the church, heresy and apostasy and schism carry with him with them automatic excommunication which includes suspension from office apostasy and schism the refusal of submission of the roman pontiff or of communion with the bishop subject to him also occur also incur an automatic loss of ecclesial office but to take effect these penalties have to be formally declared by the church's proper authority it's worth noting that formal schism is very narrowly defined in the church and involves issues only of faith sacraments or legitimate governance so I think this is really important because it's very clear it goes uh you know it goes through the reasons really really clearly and um the final bit that he's got so in terms of if you want to go for it you can see what he says about um Puerto Rico where no one's given any any official reason why that bishop was re was relieved of duty um but there was this stuff that basically he's, he supported um it was against traditionis custodis and supported the traditional latin mass so can the pope fire a bishop um assuming torres's right to claim that francis removed him without even undertaking what would be a proper canonical process to remove a parish priest that doesn't mean the pope can't do it notwithstanding the absence of any evidence of a canonical crime or the reticence of previous popes to remove diocesan and bishops by papal fiat francis does have according to canon law supreme full immediate and universal ordinary power in the church and specifically the primacy of ordinary power over all particular churches while the pope is always joined in communion with other bishops the law explicitly states that he nevertheless has the right according to the needs of the church to determine the matter that determine the manner whether personal or collegial in exercising his 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 office so that Pope Francis can basically fire a bishop. Um, Torres case, in Torres case, Pope Francis has decreed that he is removed from office and according to canon law, no appeal or recourse is permitted against the sentence or decree of the Roman pontiff. So once the Pope has said that, then attempting to appeal a decision of the Pope is a canonical crime. Um, there's another good bit in here that I, I seem to have skipped over. Uh, where it's talked right here we go so this is a really really good bit i think this is really important right so 
it's basically has this ever happened before right and they talk about has this ever happened before popes have been reluctant to do it except in the most serious cases because the church presumes that a bishop has the right to lead and govern his see um he's usually asked to resign rather than see the pope removed from us in part because of the presumption of his right to office in the past when popes have been determined that a bishop is no longer suited for ministry even gravely so they have usually shied away from forcibly removing him even in dramatic circumstances now we don't have dramatic circumstances in either of these issues basically with strickland it seems like so if pope francis is all about parousia you know this dialogue that he keeps talking about wouldn't you think that a pope who was you know the expert in dialogue would ring up bishop strickland and say hey bishop strickland what's going on you know what's your problem um, Bishop Strickland would say, you know, well, I'm worried you're undermining the magisterium. And he'd say, well, how am I doing that? And then they would have a discussion and the Pope would bring him on side. Would that not be, if we're all on the same playbook, right? If Pope Francis isn't undermining the magisterium and if Bishop Strickland's got it wrong, then why would not Why would that not be a problem? But that's not what's happened here. Pope Francis has gone for the axe and given him the chop. So um, that's a bit of a worry, isn't it? You know, just that in itself, I think. Uh, so, all right, moving on to the next thing. It's not that present. Share screen. I'll get the hang of this one day, won't I? It's very early days. Right. Uh, so the next thing was this, I think. Yeah. So, this is the other thing that we've got going on today, right? Which is, I think, really, really interesting. This is Robert Mickens, who writes for Le Croix. And he's um, written this article in Le Croix about this bishop who is in Sicily. And this is a part of the quote, right? This is a, this is the quote here. Bishops and covering up sex abuse. Sex abuse. Francis remarks to the group from Sicily appear to be much more problematic, though very few media outlets, at least in the English speaking world, have even noted them. Basically, the Pope began that the encounter by defending Sicilia Bishop Rosario Gizana, a Sicilian prelate who's been accused of protecting a priest who's currently under trial for sexually abusing a minor. This is what the Pope has said right about this guy. This Bishop is bravo, which means good, obviously. He's been persecuted and slandered, the Pope said. He's a good man. But in an audio recording, which is part of the trial, the priest confesses to having child porn on his computer and the bishop tells him not to worry because another priest of the diocese recently did much worse. So that's okay then. So, you know, if anyone's not fit for it, I mean, these are seriously problematic things. It shows, it demonstrates that child, children are being abused right now because of this sort of thing from Pope Francis. There's a there's a bit more on that as well, actually, um, from Alexander Lucy Smith. Let me see if I can get that for you. Let's see. Okay. So let me just check. You can see that. Yeah, good. Okay. So this is... Uh, this is from uh, Father Alexander Lucy Smith, who's a priest of um, Arundel and Brighton and very clever guy. And he's written on his substack um, about this case going on in Sicily because he's got connections. He knows really well. He knows Sicily really well. And he says, the Pope recently made a few seemingly off the cuff remarks about the Bishop of, P of Piazza Armerina, Piazza Aramarina, Sicily, Monsignor Rosaria Ghisana. This is where the Pope said, the bishop is good. He's been persecuted slightly, but remind me, he's a good man, right? He's got the Italian there as well and links to the Vatican account. The Pope is sticking up for Gazzana, who is in turn in trouble for sticking up for some of his priests. A father, Rugolo, who's on trial for sex abuse, but the bishop has offered more than just moral support for the priest. That go now, there's loads of stuff here, right? Loads more stuff than even Mickens is saying in La Croix. Um, that, that would lead you to believe that this bishop is um, a serious problem 
he's not a good chap, as Pope Francis says. So, you know, <laughs> is that the only case, Mark? Is that all that's going on? Is there, uh, you know, is that all the evidence you've got? Well, I can tell you it's not, as you might well imagine. Um, and this is really the big problem to me, for me, is, you know, we can go back a number of years, but let's start with something more recent. So this was very, very recent. This I posted this on my blog. So this is my blog, if you don't know it, um, which has been running for years and years and years now. Um, and this is a this is Bishop. This is the Bishop of Speyer, who's a German who has basically posted a, a formal document saying that they're going, he, he, you know, endorsing blessing for same-sex couples. The letter includes a formalised right, and that directly contradicts Pope Francis's response to the dubia of the five cardinal, cardinals, which states it's not appropriate for a diocese, a, bishop, a diocese, a bishop's conference, or any other ecclesial structure to constantly and officially enable procedures for rituals or all kinds of matters, because not everything that is a part of practical discernment in a particular circumstance can be elevated to the title of, to the level of a rule. This would lead to an intolerable casuistry. It's just so bad. It's so bad. They're constantly making exceptions. And of course, the way that these things are, these ambiguous, complex, uh, new, you know, it's sort of all the, in the name of nuance. And um, in reality, it's just an emotional response or a psych, you know, a psycho, a, a psychological response to um, a religious problem. Exactly as stated, um, Cardinal Zen said, it's pastorally untenable. How can the church in such an important matter leave the people without a clear rule and trust individual discernment? So you've got it going on there. You can read that on my blog. Again, I'll, I'll pop the link on the bottom there. Um, but that's not, you know, that's not the only, that's not the only um, example at all either. Um, and we can go to numerous examples. This is, one of the most crazy ones. And I mean, this goes back to 2022 and this guy, so this Zanchetta was the executive undersecretary of the Argentinian Episcopal Conference, which was headed by Pope Francis, you know, before he was the Pope. And now he's behind bars, right? Um, and he was, he's one of Pope Francis's best mates. Um, and when the Pope was made the Pope, in July 23, uh, 23rd, 2013, so right at the beginning, he was given an episcopacy. He was made a bishop. Um, and it wasn't it wasn't very long. It was only four years until he disappeared. Uh, basically, he's, you know, been found guilty now and put in prison for abuse and all kinds of dodgy things. Uh, when initially the, the news came out, Pope Francis said that he'd been fitted up and he made him a nice little job in the Vatican in the back bank and moved him to Rome, okay. But it, so he didn't remove him. He didn't. He didn't uh, remove him from being a bishop. No, no, no. Um, did I have another one? Yeah, I think I did. Uh, the other one was Hollerick that I wanted to show you, which is this one here, I think. Yeah. So you know, here's another example. So we got we got bishops in. Um, the Netherlands and in Germany, who are openly pronouncing heresy. The Pope has issued dubia. We've got bishops contradicting them publicly, publishing documents. That's all being completely ignored. But we got this guy in charge of the council. So if you don't know, Cardinal Hollerick was um, made the realtor of the Synod on Synodality. And last year, um, President of the Commission of the Bishops' Conferences of the European Union and General Rapporteur of the Synod of Bishops. Um, he gave an, an interview to the German news agency KNA, where he said, I believe the sociological scientific basis of this teaching is no longer correct regarding same-sex attraction. The way the Pope has expressed himself in the past on homosexuality can lead to a change in doctrine. I think it's time for a fundamental revision of doctrine. Okay. So the cardinal said, 
that basically he he said that um the catholic that the catechism and the catholic church is wrong um, and what did he didn't get removed like strickland got removed um instead of that he basically was promoted and put in charge of the synod so what you see is that the pope is using particular people with an ideological bent and he knows those are open ideological bents and he is putting them in strategic places so that they can facilitate a widening of the conversation about these um difficult topics or controversial topics obviously then um the other big one i suppose is the mccarrick one isn't it uh, which you probably heard of. And that's this one here. So I've got it here. And this is a this is one of my favourite little quotes that I dug out from the fish wrap, um, which is the National Catholic Reporter in 2014. I think the link is still live. I was absolutely convinced that they'd pull it <laughs> because it basically it says that Pope Francis knew about McCarrick's abuse and nevertheless list, lifted the sanctions that Pope Benedict secretly imposed on him. Um, so it, like the, the quote is, McCarrick is one of a number of senior clergymen, churchmen, who were more or less put out to pastors. Well, I mean, more or less, he was sanctioned by Pope Benedict XVI. But now Francis is Pope, and prelates like Cardinal Walter Caspar, another old friend of McCarrick's, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, and McCarrick himself are back in the mix and busier than ever, McCarrick travels regularly to the Middle East and was in the Holy Land for Francis' visit in May. The bad ones never die, the Pope teased McCarrick again when he saw him. I mean, it's just being done right in front of our faces. Uh, it's absolutely crazy. Um, so moving on from that, the next thing that I wanted to show you was Cardinal Muller's response uh to bishop strickland's sacking which is on rarata chaley and cardinal muller has said that it's an abuse of the divine right of the episcopate um what is being done to bishop strickland is terrible an abuse of the divine right of the episcopate if i could advise monsignor strickland he should absolutely not resign because then they could wash their hands of his innocence which is why strickland refused to resign and was sacked according to the commandment so people who are saying you know, that, uh, like a friend of mine, Claire Short, was saying today on Facebook that he should have uh, appealed, he should have, you know, resigned, and then he could have gone through due canonical process. But you can see here that internally that's not the case. It wouldn't have happened. Um, according to the commandment of justice, a bishop can only be removed by the Pope if he has been guilty of something evil, heresy, schism, apostasy, apostasy a crime, or totally non-priestly behavior for example the pseudo benediction that insults god and deceives people about their salvation blessing people of opposite or the same sex in extramarital relations although it doesn't seem to have mattered for the bishop of Speyer. um so you've got a great account here from cardinal muller thank god for cardinal muller you know let's not forget that he was the former head of the the congregation for the doctrine of the faith the, the prelate in charge so you, you know he's a serious theologian and he, I, you know, it really does, it really is the case that he has given us a mandate to resist because, um, you know, he is a prince of the church. He's got that level of authority and he is explaining to us exactly um, what is going on and in lots of ways telling us what we, what we should be doing. Okay, so um, I've run you through a few bits there about Strickland. I would say on overall... Um, my I've given the evidence and what you know I've put some stuff on there. I've been writing about Strickland for um, a good long while since he first came to my attention. As and the way that he came to my attention was as someone who is good and orthodox. Um, he's not a, an absolute genius, you know. He's not like um, a great theologian or anything like that. But you know, we all know you don't need to be a great theologian. You can be you can have a simple faith as well as a um, a really complex faith. And that's the way the church works. And Jesus says, you know, be like little children and come to me. 
And so we're all working towards that childlike trust and that childlike simplicity. And for me, I think cases like this do incredible damage to the church because it shows that Pope Francis isn't interested in orthodoxy and he's not interested in due canonical process or justice either. Um, it is a, a political war for him. It's an ideological battle um, and he's prepared to fight it anyway. You know, you throw in his weight around um, using whatever tools are available to him. Now, will they, they've done an investigation and obviously they've put on the Vatican website as we saw um, that there's, you know, that they, as a result of that investigation, they said that he couldn't um, continue as the bishop. So what will happen as a result of that? Will they, you know, I mean, you could say that they'll bring up some mud, they'll find something to criticise him about, and that's perfectly plausible that they're, you know, I'm sure um, it's not easy running any sort of a diocese and you've got people there who are trying to take advantage of you. But again, I would have thought that the, if there was some questions about Tyler, what I would say about Tyler is that I, know, I think that they're financially in the black. They've got money to spend because they attract people um, who are faithful because of the, they've got a good bishop. Uh, the other thing is that they've got more vocations per capita than um, a lot of other dioceses. So, you know, Bishop Strickland really is a model in lots of different ways. And if there was a financial problem, I would have thought that from a management point of view, the best way to deal with it would be to offer some assistance to get someone else involved some oversight from another bishop, perhaps, or someone from the Holy See, um, you, you'd have thought that that would be an obvious way to go about resolving this. But instead, Pope Francis has gone in the most draconian manner that he possibly could and removed him completely from office. This is, t this is injustice, you know, this is a terrible thing. But there will be, I, you know, I can't help but feel that there will be massive repercussions because... Um, bishop strickland you know is is america's bishop like you know this is the way that he's portrayed but traveling around america i can tell you that if you talk to any good faithful american catholics and ask them you know you know who the good bishops are come on tell me who the good bishops are and i've done this i did this on a radio um show that i was on in in chicago last year first name at the top of the list always is bishop strickland so you have to wonder from the point of view of building the, the kingdom and preaching the gospel, um, what is Bishop Strickland doing? He's doing a really good job, it seems to me. I've not heard anything else. And he connects really well with the people. He goes out to the people and um, encourages them. And if you read his pastoral letters, if you read the things that he's put out, that some people, you know, where Peter is or whatever, have said are controversial, they're not controversial. They're just restating the faith as we've always known the faith to be. So <clears throat> one of the other things that said is that he's allowed himself to be manipulated by, um, you know, certain elements in the media. But, you know, I, I don't like that sort of attitude that says we're not allowed to comment. The only reason we're commenting, the only reason I'm making this video is because of Canon 212, really. I kind of feel that we've all got a, a duty to speak out according to our competency about what's going on in the church and things are getting increasingly worrying. This is another sign of something extremely worrying. The fact that Pope Francis is consistently covering up for bishops who abuse is extremely worrying. And I'm I, I'm sorry, I won't put my name to that. I won't, I'm not behind that. I won't defend that. Um, I, we're going to start calling you out. You know, and I, I've got a zero, you know, the Pope's supposed to have a zero tolerance policy with regard to abuse. Well, I'll tell you now, I, I have got a zero <laughs> tolerance policy with regard to abuse. Um, I think it's incredibly damaging for the church. But, in, but the, you know, the fact that anyone could justify behaving in this way and call themselves a Catholic is just, you know, they need to seriously repent. So there's no prevarication possible as far as I'm concerned. There's no, we need to have clear rules and we need to uphold those rules. And to the best of what I can see from an, I don't know Bishop Joseph Strickland, except what I see 
and hear and as a as someone who studied theology extensively and you know been i write for the catholic herald and i've written my blog for years and years and years i've engaged with the church all over the world you couldn't really ask for much better in terms of a bishop than bishop joseph strickland god love him so i would inc i would ask you all of you anyone listening to this to please please pray for the church but pray for bishop joseph strickland um he's a good man i really do believe that and um i think this is a terrible injustice that's been visited on him and um we need to pray for what's going on in the church but don't be scared don't, you know don't let it worry because our faith continues our faith is in jesus christ it's not in pope francis so you know <laughs> he hasn't got long left um, God love him. We pray for him. We love him. He's the Pope. We respect the office. But, you know, I think we have to be incredibly worried about the damage that's being done, not just to the church, but also to the office of the Pope, because he's damaging the credibility of the papacy um, with these arbitrary decisions, undermining um, the, the theology on many levels of the magisterium, as Bishop Strickland pointed out. Um, so we need to we need to speak out about that. And I think the only thing that's really I think this is going to be a really important thing in the church because I think that um, the American people are not going to whatever uh, you know it just seems really poor decision from Pope Francis to do this in the manner that he's done it the most mm -hmm. aggressive manner that he possibly could have done it really because um, I really do believe that. Um, the, the American people are not going to like this. They're not going to react well to this. And there will be repercussions. Um, I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm not going to suggest anything in particular, except that, I, you know, I do think we should all, if you can, write to your local bishop and just express how devastated you are. And it would be good to see some um, some... of the bishop standing up for Bishop Strickland, wouldn't it, as well? That would be a really good thing to see. So anyway, thanks very much for watching this. God bless you all. If you've got any questions or suggestions for other videos, um, pop them in the uh, comments and I'll get back to them. I'll try and post all those links for you. Um, enjoy the rest of your day. God bless.